So you said that your sexuality was used against you. Did you ever, going into the, the public sphere, think that you wanted to maybe uh, hide your orientation? No, because I feel that part of the problem with politicians, is, you know, they hide, you know, I think dishonest politicians are people who hide things. And I thought if I wanted to be a public servant, I had to be honest with people. And, um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with me. And I don't think there's anything wrong with the LGBTQ community. So if we... Um, if we participate in that, we're part of the problem, not part of the solution. So I've always been open. The funny thing was, like I say, in 1996, when I ran the first time, three of the six people running for the, for the open seat were um, gay or lesbian, but they weren't honest. I was the only one that was honest. And the other two used it against me, believe me. I thought that was disgusting. And that's one of the main reasons I didn't end up supporting the closeted lesbian because I thought, you know what, if you've got no integrity about who you are, how can you have integrity in your day-to-day -day business? The thing I was really proud of Orlando was how we reacted in love. And um, if you become consumed by hate, you know, you become part of what destroyed you. And, and ultimately, you become a part of what killed our friends. Yeah. Um, so as a leader in the LGBTQ plus community, uh, what work did you feel needed to be accomplished in the wake of the pole shooting? My first thing was, God, Frank, please tell me it's not going to be the largest shooting in American history because I didn't know the numbers, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and I said, I'll be right down. And I called my police liaison, Eddie, and because I, I knew that it would be impossible to get in there without him. Uh, and I threw on a shirt with my logo so people would know that I was an official. And we went right down there. And so I got down there about 9 o'clock, I guess. And um, I stayed there all the way till you know, midnight that night and it was just interview after interview but it was also not just because I mean I wanted to tell people how they could help I wanted to know how can you help and I said just give blood um, I got it wrong though at first I mean I heard that they had one of the reporters told me that they had relaxed the rules for give, gay men giving blood and I'm like well I'm sorry it took this but I'm glad that at least they're doing something but mm -hmm. then it was gay men who hadn't had sex in a year which to be quite honest you might not have relaxed it at all because my boys are you know whatever <laughs> So, um, but there was a relaxation, but not so all gay men could give blood, just mm -hmm. gay men who hadn't had sex with anything within a year. But just trying to encourage people to give blood. Um, once we had the one, uh, Quality Florida had their uh, website hooked, uh, set up, blew all online fundraising out of the water. But my thing was to educate and to communicate and to um, help raise money. I mean, almost from the beginning and to help get resources mm. to the families. There were things that I couldn't do though on the street. I mean, there were kids who couldn't get their, I mean, call them kids. They're young enough to be my kids. Um, they couldn't get their cars back. They had to go to work. And I'm like, your car has been impounded by the FBI, <laughs> you know? And, and so we had to set up the assistance center so that we could rent them cars. Yeah. You know, it was stuff like that, Plus, that you don't yeah. ever think about because when you are a victim of crime, you don't have your car impounded for three weeks. You know, mm -hmm. some of these victims are just now getting their belongings back now oh. from the FBI. Um, it takes a long time when you have a mass shooting of an, an investigation like this, you know, to, to be made whole, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I was just stunned by the outpouring of love. I mean, I remember one, at one point in time I was talking to somebody in the media about giving blood, and she said, you have to see this. And she turned the monitor around and it showed the lines around the blood bank. And I mean, I, I cried. I was so happy. I'm like, wow, people are really, you know, everybody's coming out and they're doing this. And uh, as as the person who represents that area, I was concerned that the neighbors were going to start complaining because, I mean, the streets were blocked. Mm. Orange Avenue is a major arterial in our city. It was blocked for a month. Um, I didn't know how the neighbors were going to react. And there was one day I was walking back to the neighborhood and there were there was an Adirondack chair with a hand letter sign that had clearly been done by a child that said we love you with rainbow and hearts and I just said wow that's that the community that I live in and that was really cool you've just listened to an audio clip from the Samuel Proctor oral history program's diverse collection of oral history interviews as part of our 50 years 50 faces fundraising campaign in the last 50 years since the program's founding in 1967, SPOP has collected over 7,000 interviews, as well as provided equitable fieldwork opportunities for students. To support our program's mission to document the voices of people from all walks of life, visit our donation page through the link in the description, or visit our website at oral.history.ufl.edu. That's oral.history.ufl.edu. SPOP, one community, many voices.